Good evening. And we- Welcome to Black Fashion Core. I am your host, and tonight we have a fabulous discussion. For now, I am your. Hold on one second. Everyone, mute your mics. Okay. Um, we're gonna have a fabulous discussion about Black women and fertility. In case you guys have not heard, um, there was a fabulous documentary that was on last Sunday by Chanel Jones of the Today Show. And next week, OWN is going to have another fabulous documentary because we need to keep talking about this. You'll understand more why. But um, we need to keep talking about this. So next week, Eggs Over Easy is coming on January 4th. And we will make sure that Shaquita tells us what time, because I forgot. But she'll tell us what time. And um, But you guys, I can't wait to have this discussion for very obvious reasons. But welcome my guest, Shaquita Lockley, who is the beautiful person that created this amazing documentary. So filmmaker who has a great production company, I noticed as well. Then we have Dr. Camille Hammond. Who we, will be, we'll, we will be calling Camille because she runs the Cade Foundation, which you guys will hear more about. The links to their websites, FYI, are in the post. So if you guys need to get in touch with any of these ladies, the links to their websites are in the post. We have Calais Stewart, who has her own website too, Warrior Wednesday. She's been talking a lot about this. She's a great advocate for fertility and black women. And these ladies are in the documentary. So I am so excited to start this conversation. Everyone, please share this. Please share it, share it, share it to everybody you know, because I don't care if you're a woman or a man, you know somebody who is trying to have a baby or you don't know that they're trying and they just haven't mentioned it to you, but they are trying. So, and then you might learn something on how to actually deal with people who are trying or not trying or whatever. So please make sure that you share the broadcast and make sure you follow black doctor and subscribe to their youtube channel if you haven't already but thank you so much everyone welcome hold on having us okay thank you for thank you for being here so let's get right into it for let's start with our filmmaker first so please tell us what gave you this idea like how did this pop into your spirit okay well first of all thank you so much for for having us um back in 2016, I went to my regular annual um, physical, my pap smear. I was 41. The doctor, my doctor looked at the chart and said, Ms. Lockley, you have a birthday coming up. Your eggs are turning 42. What do you want to do with them? And I don't know what else she said because I kind of blacked out. I work in film, so I knew what my next gig was going to be. I knew like where I was vacationing. I knew I was, where I was going to go for brunch on Sunday. I didn't know what she was talking about. What would I need to do with an egg? And so that kind of was on my mind. Um, In addition to that, I had fibroids. My mother had fibroids. Her sisters had fibroids. So I knew what that looked like. And we kind of been keeping an eye on it. But when you throw that into the mix of eggs, it was too much. So everywhere I went for the next maybe six months, the topic would just randomly come up. I was at a brunch and um, a close friend mentioned that she and her husband had miscarried from international donor eggs. What is that? Um, Somebody else had had a feminine surgery. I knew what the feminine surgery was because I took her to her surgery, her little procedure, but it wasn't a little procedure. It was a myomectomy, which if you don't know, is basically a C-section where they take out all your fibroids instead of a baby. baby. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. So when I I started thinking like, well, why would we call it a feminine procedure? Like that's a whole cut your body open surgery because it was an abdominal one. Um, So I said, you have to miss. I mean, that's some time off work. I mean, there's a lot of downtime when it comes to those myomectomies. Yeah. So is it a feminine procedure? That is that to me sounds like a pedicure. It's something small. It's not a whole big surgery where they, they give you like they cut your body open. So I said I would do a 10 to 15 minute short. 
Um, just for my friends, I, I'm a graduate of Spelman College and I'm in a sorority. I'm a Delta. So I figured if we weren't talking about it at all of my circles, like my I'm a Delta, half of my friends are AKAs. So the sororities, we're not talking about it. I went to a women's college. My, this set, set of friends aren't talking about it. All of my friends who are just women in neither, neither um category, we still aren't talking about it. My church friends, we're not talking about it. So this 10 to 15 minutes would just be enough to say like hey check and see if you got fibroids you shouldn't be in that much pain you shouldn't bleed for 90 days like something is wrong here go, go see a doctor but what happened is once i would tell one person they'll say oh you remember my cousin or oh what about my friend or you know we use a surrogate well what is it uh, well, no she said a gestational carrier what is that because i knew what a surrogate was but i didn't know what the terminology was that she was using so that 10 to 15 minutes just kept extending itself. And then I ran out of money. So I had to do a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and a lot of people, you know, it, we did the campaign during homecoming. So everybody kind of chipped in and helped me get over that hump. And the next thing I looked up and we had a feature film. And mostly everyone in this film, I knew them personally. There were only a handful that I didn't know or have referred by someone who we had in common, like one degree of separation. Wow. So how long did it take? Years. I started the research in 2016. It airs on January 4th <laughs> at 9 p.m. on on the Oprah Winfrey Network. That's five years and some change. So it's been forever. And I've met these wonderful women along the way. When I first started, there were two women, two black women doing this work in this space. One of them is sitting here. That's um Dr. Camille Hammond. And then the other fertility for Fertility for Colored Girls is um, Dr. Stace, Reverend Stacy Dunn up in Chicago. That was the only two names. I couldn't get to Chicago for that interview, but I could get to D.C. for Camille. So we have, thank God, we were able to um, to get her. And so that was like my first set of interviews. Then another year would pass, and then we would get some more money. <laughs> so I end up in L.A. Um, with Kelly, who Keisha Knight Pulliam is the, she started as just the narrator um, for us an executive producer and she was on a set on a film with Kelly. So she calls one day and is like, I got a new friend. Her name is Kelly. You need to talk to her. She froze her eggs and she's going to be in our documentary. So we have Kelly. <laughs> that was like two or three years in. So five and some change. And we are finally seeing the light of day with the project. Thank God. Amen. I've been following you for a while and I just, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people kept asking because I know I typed a couple of times. When can we see it? Where can we no see it? <laughs> <laughs> that has been the consistent answer. Right. So no. next let's talk to Kalei and then we'll, we'll come to you, Camille. So Kalei, what brought you to this? Um, now, like I said, I've heard some of your story, obviously from documentary, and I've watched several of your lives because, oh, and you guys, Dr. Cindy Duke was not feeling well, so that's why she's not with us tonight. But um, Kalei and Dr. Cindy have actually done several IG lives together that I've seen. So what brought you to this place? Well, um, when I was 37 years old, I got out of a seven year relationship and I realized that I gave my best baby making years away to the wrong person, situation, whatever you want to call it. Basically, I wasted time. I didn't realize that not only was I giving my effort and my communication and let's try this to work it out, but that I was giving away my biology. And no one had said that to me and still they haven't. But I said it to myself and I prayed to God about it. And I really heard the spirit tell me, go freeze your eggs. I had done very minimal research at that time because I knew I always wanted to be a mother. Um, and I knew that the time was not right for me to be a mother, but that I wanted to preserve something. And so I went like gangbusters into figuring this all out. We broke up on a Sunday. And by that following Wednesday, I was in a fertility clinic with a fertility doc doctor, you know, between the gap of my thighs, child, letting me know that uh, what my fertility status was looking like and whether or not I was a good candidate to freeze eggs. And when I got the thumbs up that I was, I just got a credit card and I got, you know, all of those little things that come in the mail about sign up for a new credit card. I just grabbed all of them. Whoever gave me the largest limit was who I was going to sign up with. And I put the whole thing 
on that credit card. I called my mother, who I lovingly call Mama Stu, who comes to Warrior Wednesdays all the time. And I said, we're going to freeze my eggs. I'm going to fly you out to L.A. And she's like, we, we, we doing what now? Let's do it. And so she was the one that was giving me the needles and, and going through this whole entire process with me. Um, I was blessed to get 29 eggs in um, one round. And that's not normal. So I don't I don't want to, um, you know, I want to debunk all the, the different myths and things as I tell my personal story. But I but one of the reasons that it's important to say that I did get that at, at age 37 is because we are told um, because we don't know about we don't know about the quality of eggs. OK, so the, the, all of that changes. But we are kind of told that once you reach the age of 33, 35 is over. And I heard so many misconceptions out there where for me, that was the beginning of my fertility journey at 37. And um, and then as time went on and the right relationship hadn't materialized yet, um, I decided to write a film called 29 Eggs. Um, about my journey and sold it to um, the Lifetime Network and then COVID hit. So when COVID hit, um, I wasn't able to shoot the film. And that's why I started Warrior Wednesdays, which was my opportunity to continue to talk in this space. Um, and I wound up speaking not only about egg freezing, but about endometriosis, PCOS, MRKH, um, adenomyosis, fibroids, miscarriages. We've run the whole gamut. We've even done black men and infertility. And as Shaquita said earlier, I was blessed, like super blessed to be a part of Eggs Over Easy. I was working on a film in Atlanta with Keisha and we became like quick friends. And I, of course, was opening my mouth like, yeah, girl, I froze my eggs. I was actually playing with her and her daughter, I think, when I said it. And then she's like, I got a documentary. You need to be in it. And Shaquita and I spoke on the phone and I was like, like, you're my people. And so we figured out a time when she was going to be in L.A. and um, we shot it. And I could could not be more grateful for the opportunity to tell my story with her direction and with her guidance and with her love, because she is just an advocate among advocates. And I just I treasure her. And I'm so excited for you guys to see Eggs Over Easy. So thrilled. So Camille, tell us, how did you become a part of this sorority of women and <laughs> fertility? It really is. Um, I, so I got a call from Shaquita and she just asked, uh, she told me what she was doing and asked if I would be willing to share my story. And I'll share a little bit about that story right now. But uh, my husband and I met, I'm a, I'm a physician. Um, my husband and I met the first week of medical school and we had what I would consider a fairy tale courtship. Uh, and three years later, we got married, started trying to build our family immediately because I knew I had endometriosis, stage four endometriosis, and it would be hard for me to get pregnant. And it didn't work. The old fashioned way, you know, despite our best efforts, we never actually got pregnant. So a year after we got married, we started seeing a fertility specialist and over the next few years ended up having five six unsuccessful rounds of IVF, after which point the doctor came and said, you know, you're young, you're healthy, but you're not getting pregnant. And, you know, you're at a point where you may want to think about doing something different because doing the same thing and expecting different results is not likely to yield what you're looking for. And we were devastated. And uh, my mom and dad asked if my mom could carry a baby for us because she was healthy. Now she was 54 and postmenopausal. But, um, you know, they were they were confident and faithful. And initially we said no, uh, but they were persistent and we prayed a lot about it. And and ultimately she ended up carrying my triplets and delivered them when she was 55 years old and postmenopausal. Am I still here? Yeah, I- you're amazing. Oh, okay, okay. Your mother is amazing. Okay. Yeah. Wow. My mom is my Shiro. Um, so um, I actually work with a gestational carrier. And um, for those of you who don't know what a gestational carrier it's, is, it's a woman who carries another woman or another couple's embryo. She's not genetically related to that egg or to that embryo. She, she is just, she's just an incubator, uh, you know, a, a right. loving incubator. So my mom was my gestational carrier. I would say like the bun in the oven. A bun in the, the oven. oven. It's somebody else's bun in your oven. 
And uh, those, that pregnancy was a triplet pregnancy. So I have triplets and they just turned 17 yesterday. Wow. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank that you. That is awesome. But yeah, your mom is, that is amazing. So Thank the first thing I have to say, Camille, your mother's a black woman. Now, how did she say, oh, well, I could do that for you. Like, and what did her friends and family say to her? So my mom loves her family and she would do anything to support her family. So it wasn't a question about, well, I'll do this or I wouldn't do that. She She's the one that saw it on TV and came to <laughs> us to say, hey, what about what about this? Um, that, as a matter of fact, she saw it on 60 Minutes when I was a freshman in college. Uh, they were watching a show about a mother who had done that for her child and, um, you know, didn't actually bring it to my husband and I until and we were six rounds mm -hmm. in and really running out of hope and running out of faith and running out of joy and running out of everything. Um, and so I'm really grateful that she and my dad were persistent, that they didn't forget. Um, and I think that's the whole point of this, this documentary kind of to bring it back to yeah. eggs over easy. We want everybody to know that regardless to where they are on the kind of pathway to parenthood or the reproductive pathway, uh, that there is reason to hope you're not the first, you're not the only and support is available. Am I right, Shaquita? Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And many times we feel like we're kind of just in a silo, like you're in, you're with yourself. You may not have a conversation with anybody, including your doctor. Sometimes you have it with your right. doctor. You certainly aren't having it with your friends. And so you do feel isolated and you do feel alone. We have a, a therapist who talks about it in the film, your own isolation island, thinking that it's just you. Mm -hmm. When they're in, And when I started the research, there were two. And of course, over time, plenty of people have been doing some work. Yes. But we didn't know where they were. Right. <laughs> so now, like with our little close knit community, we know how to find each other. But five, six years ago, we didn't. So the message is people are here. They're doing the work like you don't have to know all the answers. You can follow Dr. Cindy. And I do hope you feel better, Dr. Cindy. But you yeah. can follow her page because she's giving out nuggets all day. All she's day and night. All day. Living her best doctor life, telling you everything you need to know. So you don't have to just think that it's only you. And that's the message yes. that we're trying to get out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I realized that because I was a doctor and I have a lot of younger friends, they would come to me and, you know, my doctor had mentioned something about egg freezing. I was like, um, yes, totally. You should do it. And they were like, she's not crazy. I go, no, but I'm only, yeah, exactly. This is when you should do it, do it now. And so I, you know, was encouraging a lot of people. And then I had older friends. So actually Dr. Cindy and I back in 2019, October of 2019, we had what was supposed to be the first of many. 2020 was supposed to be our year. And then you know what happened. Um, but, um, but Dr. Cindy and I talked about it. And we realized that this was a conversation that wasn't being had. We also realized that in our community, which was mentioned in the documentary too, we were always told don't get pregnant. But nobody yes. ever comes back and says, oh, you're running out of time. You need to hurry up and do something. No one says that. And so because my grandma didn't say it, my mama didn't say, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm running out of time. Now, I have heard in other communities, grandparents have purchased egg freezing for 21 year olds, 30 year olds. That community obviously is not the same shade as the rest of us in this group here, but they have done that. And then there, I'm sure, you know, as um, and we'll talk about the Kate Foundation, but I'm sure, you know, Camille, there are pharmaceutical companies that have grant programs for specific types of people that are not black people because they have done the work and they've spoke to the pharmaceutical companies to get these things going. So we, it's just, it, we were missing something. So I told Cindy, I said, we need to do something about that. And the only place I could start was where I live in Chicago. So we had an event and we, it was free. It was free drinks, free food. It was at a nice sports bar and it was me and Cindy and we were answering questions. And do you know, more than 50% of the women there were black female doctors. Because as you know, Camille, they didn't teach us this in med school. So Amen. we didn't even know what we didn't know until we were all together. And they were like, I had no idea. Yes. And I said, yeah, I didn't know until Cindy became my good girl. You know, that's my girl. So, and she's also my REI. So <laughs> once Cindy became my friend, that's when I learned all this information. And so I was like, 
Cindy, we need to talk about this. So what we had planned to do last year was we were going to go and in the evening have a discussion with women of a certain age like us. And then the daytime, hopefully be able to hit one of the HBCUs and talk to the young ladies. So we could tell them, you know, it's great. You're about to graduate. You're going to, you know, you want to go buy that whatever car, whatever house. But you should freeze your eggs before you do anything else. Really quickly, just go do that. Then go and do the rest of that stuff. Yeah. And so that was our goal. That was our mission. And God willing, we will still be able to do it, but we just couldn't do it in 2020. But we really um, wanted to get that conversation going because unfortunately, they don't teach you this, but it is something so important. And black women have such high numbers of infertility. Besides the fact that, you know, we sometimes wait too late. We have endometriosis. We, we, are, we are the women that have fibroids. Yes, other people do, but we are the number one in the you know world that have fibroids so these are all things that could possibly hinder you from getting pregnant so i'm 45 and i went to an event back in 2018 or 19 and it was called cryos and cocktails and obviously we were talking about egg freezing and it was fabulous except for it was so it was free there were seven black women and probably it was 60 women there 50. And so I felt like we were being left out of the conversation. And that was the other reason why I said, Cindy, we have to do something because clearly they didn't market this to us and we need this. And so with that, um, you got a free uh, fertility workup kind of a thing. And so we got to find out our, our, um, our ovarian reserve. They did an ultrasound, you know, vaginal ultrasound, all that stuff. And so I found out then that my numbers were actually pretty good for somebody of that age. So I was like, okay, so... I also found out because of my age, she said, you have a greater chance of having a successful birth, um, pregnancy and birth with embryos being frozen versus eggs being frozen. So that is the mission that I'm on. I am freezing embryos. And like I said, Cindy's my REI. And so we started that process last year. And then I had my first retrieval this, um, this past summer. And so I have unfortunately some, not unfortunately, but I have some more retrievals to go because of my age. I have to do some more some more work, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's why I really enjoyed the, the, um, I enjoyed, I, I was able to watch eggs over easy and that's why I enjoyed it so much because it really covered everything. It even talked to people who do not want to have children and that's yes. okay too. Yeah, absolutely. I think overcoming infertility, um, means getting to a place of peace with whatever your decision is about family building, like understanding what the options are, and then deciding what's best for you. But I want to get, you know, Kelly has talked about having egg showers, which is yeah. something that you just mentioned. And I just, when she mentioned it, I thought that's brilliant. Yes. Um, yes, I have talked about having egg showers. And I think when we're out of this uh, COVID space a little bit better, if that is going to happen, I don't know. I really want um, Shaquita and Camille and Dr. Renee and other um, black fertility advocates to get together in one city and throw a really great big egg shower so that women can really see that they're not alone and meet the the faces and the people that are out here fighting for our rights, fighting for the insurance and, and different ways that we can finance this. And, and the reason that I brought up egg showers, and thank you for saying that, Dr. Camille, and I just want to mention that Shaquita and Dr. Camille have both been on warrior wednesday so dr renee you're gonna have to come on there now okay. so but uh they have both been on and we we talk for a good hour honey we cry we do all the all the daggone things and shaquita came on right after a, a myomectomy so it, it was it was just my honor that she spent her recovery time speaking to us but um back to the egg shower people always ask me or, or even mention to me well it was okay for you to afford it because you're an actor because you're this and this and first of all you don't know my bank account that's number Amen. one but number two um, I, I also understand that concern. And I think that that's something that stops people in their tracks before they even get started. Before they even get started, they make an assumption that this is something that I can't afford. And maybe it's not, but here's the thing, where there's a will, there's a way. So I always ask people, how many baby showers do you go to a year? Of course, this is pre-COVID, but look, we're in this, this world now. So how many virtual baby showers do you go to a year? How many first birthday parties, second birthday parties? How much time do you spend celebrating other people's pregnancies? And how much money do you spend? And here's the thing, we need to start celebrating people that are on the journey. 
it shouldn't be that once I have the baby in my belly, then I can get the support system around me. And then the people that I love can pour into me, whether that's financially or whether that's emotionally or whatever it might be. Why is it that we are left out and isolated? So I was telling women and men to throw an egg shower, to register at paypal.com, venmo.com, you know, whatever it is. And people would say, well, who's going to come to that? And I'm like, whoever loves you, whoever loves you, whoever understands your journey and not everybody will understand it, but I bet you there will be people that do. And whether you make all the money or not in one shower to freeze your eggs or whatever the situation might be, just knowing that there are people that are willing to listen and to pour into you and be a part of the process automatically takes a little bit of that isolation, just even if it's just a little off of your soul. And so you can move forward in a lighter way knowing that you're not the only one out here going through it. You're not the only one that needs finances and that there are people that are there to support you and help carry you over the finish line, whatever that finish line might be. Start celebrating your journey now. Definitely. And you know, that's another thing people, oh my God, it costs so much, but you guys don't realize that it did cost a lot in the very beginning, but now we're, you know, 10, 15, we're getting more years on this. It doesn't cost as much. Also, thankfully, several states, I think the number now is 17. If somebody else knows, let me know. But they are mandated to cover something with, in, with fertility via insurance. Illinois happens to be one of them, thankfully. But, um, and so it doesn't mean, obviously, that it's completely free. You don't have to pay anything, but it is helpful. And that's another thing. Like she mentioned, there's laws that need to be changed, insurance, because there's no reason that all 50 states should not have some sort of fertility coverage. There's no reason. That's not fair. But it's not as expensive as it used to be because of the fact, yes, insurance does cover. Then you have fabulous companies like your Googles and your Amazon that take that cover fertility treatments. So that's something else. When you go to a new job, that's you right. talk to HR and you figure out what are the benefit packages and figure out the right benefit package for you. Because what people don't also realize is that you have options when you go, just cause you want you know, you work there doesn't mean you just have to take what they give you. You have options. That's why the human resource department is there. The benefits, you need to talk to them and you need to read the fine print. I'm self-employed. So what I did was I had my own policy, of course. Well, I went and called the insurance company, asked a million questions and figured out I needed a different plan because I took my deductible from $3,000 to $750. Once my deductible is met, my, my fertility is covered 80%. That's a huge difference. 80 20 is a huge difference. $3,000 deductible. I am a single human being, thankfully, who does not get sick often. So for me to break down and I could never get to $3,000. I don't think I made $1,500 by the end of the year, but $750, I can do that. So you just have to ask questions and make sure. And a lot of people don't know this. You yes. have to ask the questions and inquire and figure out what is going to work for you. Your spouse's insurance might have a coverage you don't know about. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to also shout out some of the companies that may be, uh, those are great companies that you mentioned, but I think many of us live in neighborhoods where there's a Starbucks. Uh, they oh, offer yeah. fertility coverage up to 25000 for 20 hours a week. Um, I think even Amazon provide some form of fertility coverage for some of their workers. So mm -hmm. uh, there are there are a lot of there are a lot of places um, that will provide some sort of coverage. Um, but again, as Dr. Renee just said, you have to ask. Yeah, you got to ask the questions. So Camille actually has a foundation that amongst there's lots of places. And that's the other thing you can find money if you want to find it. It's out there. You got to find it. So can you tell us more about the Cade Foundation? Absolutely. So first of all, Cade Foundation is actually the Tanina Q. Cade Foundation, named after my mom, because our goal is to give families the gift that she and my dad gave my husband and myself, uh, help with the gift of parenthood. And so we give out grants of up to $10,000 to help with fertility treatment or adoption. We also do a lot of education, both for patients, letting them know about all of the opportunities to become a parent and supports available, 
as well as for doctors, making sure that they know about the new standards of care. Our, our focus is really more OBGYNs, generalists um, who are not going, who are not specialists, because they're more likely to see people who have infertility. Right. Um, so we do a lot of education, and we give out money, and um, we've given out over 1.5 million dollars. Uh, thus far, last year we supported 17 families um, with grants, and our goal really is to fund 25 families every year. And information about the grant is available online 24/7 at cadefoundation.org. You can apply. Um, all, all the information is right there, and you know our goal really is to support as many families as possible. That is just fabulous. Um, and her, like I said, all the links. Everyone's links I have put in the post so you guys can click and go and check everything out. But um, but that is just awesome. But I didn't know even even Dr. Cindy taught me I didn't know there was grants out there. She's like, oh, yeah, so and so and so and so. And I'm like, what? What? And also many people don't know a lot of the pharmaceuticals will give you a discount on your meds. And these discounts are not going to necessarily, you don't have to be destitute. There's lawyers and doctors and judges and stuff that are getting these discounts. So it's not, you know, it's really based on, um, based on income usually, but they will give you a discount. It could be up to, I think, 70%, but you have to, you have to ask the questions. You have to do the research. Um, I started a Facebook group of black women called Black Women Fertility. Dr. Cindy was one of the first people in the group with me. And we are literally there so that we have actually Dr. Cindy, Dr. Tia Jackson Bay, who is another black female REI. She's awesome. out of New York. Um, just opened an office in Brooklyn. And I think there's another one. But we have about three or four REIs that are in there so that we have proper information coming to us. Um, unfortunately, I've been in some groups where I'm just like, oh, you're doing what? You're eating what? And like, it's just insane. And because I'm a doctor, I'm like, that doesn't add up. But, <laughs> but that's why I was like, I wanted a group where you could get factual information, kind of like what we're going through with COVID. I want you to have the facts, the facts, the actual facts from the people that know. And, um, you know, people have, because unfortunately, and this is why we're here at blackdoctor.org, we always tell everyone your best care usually is going to come from someone that looks like you. And that's just the truth. There's been, you know, there's numbers out there that prove that. And unfortunately, you will, you know, 40 year old woman goes into her white OBGYN. And unfortunately, they might tell her, oh, no, you don't have a chance. But you haven't even tried. You haven't looked. You haven't given her options or anything. And so that's why it's important sometimes that you do see the right doctor to put you in the right position, you know, point you in the right direction. And I'm not saying everyone's like that, but I've heard horror stories, unfortunately, where it's happened. And then they finally find the right doctor and they end up with a family of kids. So it's really important that we have factual information. So that's why I started my Facebook group. That link is in the, in the post as well. So that we can just get information, make sure everyone knows the different places to go find funding different doctors in different cities and states. Um, you know, we have people leaving the country to go get this, you know, done. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but not everyone can afford even the plane ticket to, you know, get out of the country. But many times when you, when they leave the country to go to South Africa or to these other countries, it is significantly cheaper. One of the right. people I interviewed, her flight and to stay for a week and to have her egg retrieval was $5,000. You're not getting that for just yeah. the drive to the doctor down down the street from your house if you're here. This is true. So, this is true. Which is the other reason why we need to make sure that we leg change the legislature and get things because there is no reason that you know fertility like the fertility meds for the most part most insurances it doesn't fall under your prescriptions. If it, it doesn't fall under pharmaceuticals, it falls under medical, which is a huge difference because most people know if you have insurance, you go to the drugstore, your copay is minimal. But can you imagine receiving your bill when you're about to have your egg retrieval? And I'm sure ladies that have done this know <laughs> exactly. The bill is like $7,000 and I'm not joking. <laughs> well, I, I want to just mention that there are, there are only a handful of manufacturers of fertility right. meds. And many of them, like you said, Dr. Renee, do have programs where they will give you a, a discount on the medication. So absolutely talk to your doctor, 
about that, ask about that. And then you can also just go to their websites because, you know, they, they publish a lot of information directly to patients. It's, you know, information that they want to share directly with patients Mm -hmm. so that they know about the resources. So you don't have to struggle alone and just think that, that there are no supports available. Yeah. I mean, my medicine came from a pharmacy, I think in California, I'm all the way on the other side of the country, (laughs) but you know, this is, this was the cheapest route to go. Even the insurance company, their medications weren't as cheap as this place, which was just crazy to me. And I told the insurance company, I was like, you know, your specialty pharmacist actually came in higher than me going to this out of network pharmacy. And they were like, you're right. That, that is not right. Exactly. Like that that doesn't make sense. So it's just so important that we do work on changing the legislature, getting the information out so that we all know, ask your OBGYNs. If you are a woman of a certain age, if you're getting about 35 and you're single, you need to ask your doctor some key questions. You need to ask them to check your AMH level. And if they can't, if they don't know, you know, what's how, what's high, low, whatever, then maybe then you should make an appointment or consultation, at least with an REI to talk to them about your results. Um, but you want to make sure that your, your hormone levels are adequate, because let me tell you something that I learned very early on, just because you have a cycle every month, as in period, whatever you want to call a menstrual cycle, just because you have one every month on time every month does not mean that you will not have a problem getting pregnant. And Dr. Renee, can I say something to that? Um, And Shaquita, you can speak to this as well, because um, Shaquita, this amazing film, Eggs Over Easy, which we're all here to talk about today. But one of the things that I was, I saw um, a commercial for it, um, for OWN for January the 4th. And one of the cuts that was there was the question that I asked, to your point, Dr. Renee, is why aren't fertility testing, like the AMH levels, the FSH levels, part of our annual gynecological care? Why is it something that a patient has to ask for? Because I just want to be candid and clear. I did not know what AMH was, what anti-malarian hormone was, follicle stimulating hormone was. I did not know any of that until I went through the egg freezing process, because I think we can all agree we're taught sex education, but we are not taught reproductive education. And so part of the problem is that women do not even know, or people that identify as a woman or someone with a uterus don't even know that they have to ask a question such as, can you check my hormone levels or my AMH? So why is that not part of our pap smears, our annual care to begin with? So I know that AMH is not cheap. I knew that because I had to pay for it. But um, mm-hmm. so I so did I, yeah. I, but the FSH, it, they can put that on pretty easily. Am I right, Camille? Yeah, FSH is not is not is not like AMH. So FSH should be something that should you're right should be part of your annual. And really AMH should as well. With the AMH, mine was like $100 that I had to beg for from from a a separate doctor, not my normal doctor. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's so interesting to me is people who are not Black women, women who are not Black women, um, they're using, I think it's called Modern Fertility. Uh, Dr. Hammond, you can speak to it a little bit more maybe. But it's a hormone. It's a They just, you put it a little bit of blood and they run your hormone, hormones. You know, so I think I've seen that advertising on Facebook. It's $159. Now, many Black women may not have $159. It's clearly, like, they don't market it as where I've not seen a lot of Black people in the advertisements. Um, you know, how although Shaquita, I've Instagram. done it, Shaquita, mm-hmm. I've done it and it's on my website. And if y'all click on the link for me, you'll get 10% off. I'm just going to say that yes. because yes. of exactly what you are saying, because women do not have the access to this. And they don't know about it. That look like us. And so that look I, like us. Th- that look like us. And I'm very particular about anything I'm going to lend my voice or face to. And I really did my research and I did a live with, um, with modern fertility and i did the test and i went over the results my own personal results but keep speaking keep speaking shaquita i just wanted people to know that because our faces are not the ones because there's been other people that reach out to me can you do this will you lend your face to this and i'll look at their pages and i will not see one black woman all of you know the posts that they have are white women 
white babies. And I say, no, because you do not speak to women like me. You do not advertise to women like me. And I take personal offense to that because my uterus, my ovaries, they matter. And so we have to make sure that we hold these companies that are offering fertility help out there accountable to all races and all women. I'm sorry, I just had to say that part. No, no, thank you. A thousand percent. And that is the whole point of this film. I had a friend, like she's like a play sister. She's a nurse by vocation. Um, she watched it. She saw an early, early version of the film. Low key panic as her doctors, they're like, oh, no, you're fine. You're like 32. So she did the modern fertility. And her numbers were very, very low. And she froze her eggs within like three months. And now she has a beautiful little girl. So it's not for nothing. No, we're not in the advertisements. We Black women are not their target market. But when I look at it, if you have $300 for some sneakers or $700 for your Yeezys, if this is important to you, you have $159 for this test that they don't market to us. Um, because at the end of the day, although it was not, we were not the intended market, it still can help you. But that doesn't change the fact that doctors should be asking. One of someone asked me, What is the takeaway from the film? So for us and our team, the takeaway is to ask early. So we did a soft launch this past summer on Ask Early in three phases. Girls, women, Gen Z, Gen, Gen Z, millennial, and some of the younger um of us, what am I, Gen X, um, we should know the questions because AMA should not just be heard for the first time when you're 42 years old. Right. So we have to educate and say, girls, women, people with uterus, <laughs> go to the doctor, ask them, I am interested in what is happening with my body. Can you give me something to get me to this answer? Like, what is, where am I on this fertility um, space? Because if I'm 25 and my AMH is like 10, that's great. And if you give me the test five years later and it dropped to two, maybe I should be alarmed. If you give it to me five years later and it's at 0.5, now we have a problem. And we missed 10 years of you never having this conversation with me. We missed 10 years and 10 points on this AMH scale. This doesn't even include all the other tests that you have to have, but it's the, a, a starting point. So we start there. That's the first ask. The second ask is to physicians. Why aren't you asking, like with my doctor, who is awesome, when she asked me at 42, I always would think, I've been here for over a decade. Why didn't you ask me at 32? Not that there's any, you know, shade on her. The institutions, which is the third part. But for doctors, they don't ask because it's not something they're taught to ask. That's not in the list. So if you notice when the HPV whole movement started and doctors will wear these buttons and say, like, ask me about HPV. Right. Why don't they ask, ask me about AMH? Like, ask me what is happening with your body. So that's the doctors. They need to ask their patients, hey, have you considered that maybe in 15 years you will want to have a child? Or even if you don't, do you want to know your hormone level? So that's the second way that we ask early and then the third is the institutions it is snma and nma and all of these organizations that doctors pay their membership dues to who get to decide what is asked what are we teaching doctors to ask their patients um where are they in this conversation because i had a heated debate with with a physician who just thinks it's unnecessary and we sh we're wasting money unless you know you want to have a child um, no, it's not. It's called I would like to plan for my life. So maybe I would have liked to know at 30 what my AMH was. And because it's my body, I kind of feel the same way, like what's happening with Texas and other people making decisions mm -hmm. for the bodies of women. That's how I feel. So when a physician, which is what happened to me, a, my, a secondary physician, I was referred out. This woman, a black woman, and I, all of my doctors are black women, and they're normally excellent. But in this situation, when this woman refused to do an AMH because I couldn't say for sure that I wanted to have a child, I just wanted to know because it was a, it was something new to me that I didn't know that was happening in my body. So the fact that she could say no, and I only remember from watching the Oprah episode from years ago when she still had a show, and they said, if you ever ask for a test and the doctor says no, ask them to put it in writing. They will either give you the test or you, you know, or it will be in writing and you can get another opinion. So when I pressed the issue and said, okay, please put that in writing. She did the, she immediately signed off. I went downstairs, did the little blood work. It was like a hundred dollars. And I got that number, which I needed 10 years before. And so it's very annoying. It's very frustrating. So when I think of what is a takeaway, two takeaways, one, keep hope alive. Cause you know, you gotta have some hope no matter how, crazy some of the stories sound so do keep hope alive but in addition to that ask early 
whether you're the woman going to your doctor, whether you're the doctor seeing people who look like me and all of us on the screen, or whether you are the organization who is teaching these doctors what they should and should not be asking us. Ask early. It's, it's really very simple. We have, uh, I think it's Keisha, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Washington. She said after watching this, she's going to reach out to her doctor. So that that's exactly what we want to happen. Please reach out to your doctor. Someone else wants to know how often these tests should be done. So first of all, AMH is anti-malarian hormone, like Kalei said. And what it does is it can kind of guide you towards what your ovarian reserve is. And ovarian reserve is how many eggs you have left. A lot of people don't know, we women are born, well, females are born with all the eggs that they're ever going to have. There's not gonna be any more. So that percent starts dropping dramatically at 35. And that's why they always say, oh, well, you're not gonna have any eggs to freeze. And Kalei told us she got 29 eggs at 37, which is awesome. But that's why they always say that if you're over 35, it's gonna take several <clears throat> egg freezing for you to get a certain, you know, a nice number. But, um, and then not only the numbers go down, but then the quality goes down as well. So that is why AMH is so important. Now, honestly, we have a yearly annual and I think personally, I would go every year and I would ask for my AMH, right? That would be ideal to me, but I got so much push pushback from the medical community. So I'm like, at least every five years, yeah. if, if you have, uh, if your mother or grandmother has breast cancer, they're going to screen you at least every five years. I so agree. at the least every five years, because we know that when you hit those age benchmarks, you get cut in half, your egg count cuts in half. It doesn't Absolutely. like just phase out and no. you go off into the sunset. No, it's drastic. And I know this sounds like, harsh and kind of alarming but those are the numbers that's right yeah. miracles happen all the time there are outliers if you're looking at the the big block of numbers those are the numbers they cut in half like at these age intervals so if if you could have an amh every year with your with your pap smear i would absolutely sign up for it because i got so much pushback from the doctors i would say at least every five years yeah. If you are with the NMA and you want to call me, that's fine. We can talk. But really, every five years, because when you wake up 10 years later and you have a point, whatever the number is, now it's a different conversation that costs tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars more. And it's just, it could have been avoided. Well, I, I agree with what you're saying about AMH. I think it's definitely something that women should, um, they should know that information earlier. But can we just talk about the fact that so often we don't even know what's going on in our families? You know, we're not yeah. talking about why auntie, whoever, uh, we just thought she just didn't want kids. No, she had infertility. Right. We may have infertility. We may have fibroids. We yes. may have endometriosis, polycystic ovary syndrome. We've got all of these things that run in our families, but because we have, almost subconsciously bought into the myth that black women are super fertile, which is perpetuated, you know, at least it was on mm -hmm. TV. Um, then we don't even, we don't even question it. So we don't realize that uh, you're not going to get pregnant just because you have sex. I mean, you know, that's something yeah. that many people were taught in sex ed. You don't want to get, you don't want to have sex before you get married because you're going to get pregnant. Well, you know, that, that doesn't actually happen all the time. It doesn't happen most of the time. Uh, a lot has to go right in order for you to conceive. Amen. Yeah. So we need to start having these conversations, open conversations with our mothers and our aunts and mm -hmm. our grandmothers to understand what happened in our family so that we can get screened for the stuff that's covered. You know, yeah. like a pelvic exam is going to be, covered. Covered. yeah, yeah. <laughs> fibroids. yeah. you know, we just talked about fibroids um, and, and some of these things that we understand, you know, that that auntie that may have facial hair or you might have a little bit of oh, facial yeah. hair, you might have to wax. Well, that, that's not that's just cosmetic. Yeah. You may be, you may have polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Yes. You know, um, it, that's something, that, there are things that we know about that are kind of part of the part of the practice of medicine right now but if you don't if you don't have any idea about it or if you have decided 
because culturally we don't feel comfortable talking about mm -hmm. it. Sometimes we say, if we talk about it, somehow we're going to cause it, you know, no, no, no. If you ask about it and you talk about it, then you're going to learn about it. Um, that doesn't make you infertile, but we need to get over some of those issues. Some of those cultural issues that are really, um, making it hard for us to get information to make good choices. Yes. Knowledge is power. And that's health across the board. You need to, and this is the holiday season. I, at dinner, you need to have a, you know, have yes. a discussion. And somebody needs to write notes. Uncle so-and-so had this, because you need to know, what did so-and-so die of? You know, and all that information you need to know. Some people don't realize that a lot of these things will keep passing and keep on going. So if your mother had fibroids, there's a good chance that the reason why you bleed for two straight weeks is because you do too. But you don't know if you don't ask the questions. Um, you know, a lot of people, their fibroids don't bother them. And then when you get pregnant, that's when all of a sudden they, the hormones that are coming to the baby start feeding the fibroid. The fibroid's getting bigger. Now, all of a sudden, they're bothering you. And so now everyone knows you have fibroids. No, you need to know before that. So she's right. You've got to have these family discussions. And you have to say, okay, well, what, what did so-and-so die of? What did so-and-so die of? Mom, did you, were you, how many pregnancies did you have? Well, there's only five of us. You had seven pregnancies. Well, what happened to the other two? All of this information is extremely important. And that's why your doctors ask you for a history because they need this information. And we're having people ask, when's the documentary airing? It's on January 4th, 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central. So that is, the 4th is on Tuesday, right? Yeah, it's on the Tuesday. Yep, Tuesday on OWN, Oprah Winfrey. Watch party. Network. Watch party. Who's joining me? I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the hashtag? We'll be on Twitter. Shaquita? Um, eggs over easy film. It's, okay. Everything is hash and at eggs over easy film. Okay, so at eggs over easy film is the Twitter, and then the hashtag eggs over easy oh, film no. is what? I'm sorry. The Twitter is just eggs film. Okay. Don't ask why. I understand. <laughs> but on the Instagram and Facebook, it's eggs, eggs over easy film, and the okay. hashtag is eggs over easy film. And Dr. Renee, I wanted to just make sure we also include, because when we talk fertility, we often start at infertility, but really when you talk fertility, it's the full spectrum. And that includes women who are child-free. Some of them are child-free by choice. Yep. Some of them are child-free by life. And it was important that, you know, we gave space to these women too, because that could be a huge psychological situation if you wanted mm -hmm. kids and, and life just you just don't have them, whether you didn't find the right partner or whether your body didn't cooperate, um, you know, that's still a part of the conversation. And then one of the things I didn't know for women, if you're under 40 and you don't have children, um, many doctors will either ask you to have your husband's permission or you can have a psych evaluation. But if you're a man and you want to have a vasectomy, you can just go do that in 15 minutes because I guess like they don't necessarily um, give us agency over our bodies. And so I just at first I didn't believe that was actually happening. But after researching, that's a thing. And so to give space to to these women as well, um, that is still your body. You still should be able to make decisions about it. And we still see you and you are a part of the conversation of what's happening with fertility as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I love that part of the film as well. I was like, oh, this is very interesting because I'm sure everyone's seen in the in the media, everyone getting on Tracy Ellis Ross because she doesn't have any children. Vivica Fox, I think, was last week in the yeah. you know, media talking. I'm like, leave these ladies and their bodies alone. That is totally well, up this to is them. their choice. And we shouldn't judge them about that choice. Right. Because exactly. it's nobody's business, first of all. Right. But secondly, yeah. it's their choice. Exactly. But I'm glad that one, we have the documentary, but two, Michelle Obama in her book talked about she used IVF. Yes. You know, Candy Burris has talked openly, Kenya Moore, um, Gabrielle Union, all these people have openly discussed that they, you know, had to use, you know, different IVF treatments. Gabrielle Union used a surrogate, um, a, go a gestational carrier, so did mm -hmm. Candy Burris on her second pregnancy, but she was someone who talked about fibroids you know, very heavily. Cynthia Bailey has discussed fibroids very openly. So all these celebrities, it's kind of blessing. It is quite a blessing that they have openly discussed and they don't have to share their business with us. Exactly. Let's be very clear. They don't have to, but I'm glad that they were willing to do that because it's normalizing the conversation it is. so that people will talk about it. 
And if we look at the past decade, 10 to 15 years, the only person that I really remember kind of being open was Angela Bassett with her twin. Yes. I remember right. the article in, in Ebony magazine. But other than that, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't bring to mind many other black women who were saying whatever was happening with them. So I think this new move, which has been within maybe the past two to three years, it hasn't been that long, um, is very helpful and it's a blessing. Yeah, because I, you know, Michelle Obama, it just like she's career woman was just getting, you know, you know, and she fell in love and thought just like Camille, oh, this is, you know, this is what you do. <laughs> and she had problems, she had, you know, problems and was able to go to the doctor and she has two children. And you know who else talked about in their book? Sonny Hostin. On the view. Her. Yes. Okay. So she, both of her children were from IVF as well. Yeah. And um, she talked about how she had trouble. Her husband's a physician. And he was like, what's going on? Something, and he didn't, you know, he didn't even understand what was happening with, you know, to her. So all these people talking about these things openly is not doing anything but helping us because we need to be okay yes. with not having secrets. Just, you know, a whole nother show would be about adoption and the secrets of adoption in the black Listen. community. <laughs> but, the shame. You know, we call it adoption. We stigmatize the shame. Exactly. Yeah. So there should be no no shame towards how you got your family. That's None. Right. In our community, like when you look at the numbers and it'll say like, oh, black people don't really adopt. We do. It's just our nephews, our nieces, our cousin is in jail, son. Um, and we raise our relatives and we're the guardian, but technically is not called adoption. So when you look at stats, our numbers look low. But from time, we've been raising all the kids in our families. And that is adoption. So we are there doing the work because we're always there. Yeah. So um Kalei, are we having trouble getting her back in? I don't know what happened. Um hold on one second, you guys. This is what happens. We have live TV. <laughs> Uh, but, um, but yes, we, we do have adoption. It's just, you know, the neighborhood, you know, we were raising the neighbor's kids and just didn't talk about it. But can we talk about the fact that, um, so often when people adopt, sometimes they get pushed back. They get asked questions like, is that your real child? Um, you know, like we need to stop doing that. It doesn't matter if it's my child, whether it came from my body or, you know, if it was my heart, right. um, so these are the things that we can work on as a community to, to just continue to empower one another and support and build up instead of making people feel ashamed for something that they had nothing to do with. Right. Nobody also not them. asking single women, when are you going to have children? When are you going to get married? Okay. Don't ask married people when they get married or even before they got married, when are they going to have children? Hello. Stay out of people's bedrooms. <laughs> uh, when are you do when you're just chubby? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> None you of you are business. bloated or fibroids. That's right. right. You never right. know. Some you people don't realize how big fibroids can get. Fibroids really Absolutely. can get so large that it does look like you are three, four, five months pregnant. Six. Yeah. I, my uterus was at a, a six month pregnant person by the time I had the myomectomy. I got caught in between COVID, so you couldn't go to the hospital. It wasn't an emergency, so I ended up having to wait a whole, basically a whole year, almost a whole year before I could get in. So. <sighs> Oh, oh. Wow. Yeah. So, so every day to 80 uh, upwards of 80% of black women before the age of 50, which is a staggering number. And if that was happening to any other demographic, like if, if men had a tumor growing in their genitalia area, that was the size of a six month pregnant person. What? It would be <laughs> research, surgeries, a pill you could take to make it evaporate so that you're left without any any scars. Um, right. but it's not. It's us. So. Yeah. So I, and you're right. If, if it was men, white men especially, they would have figured out the whole Can thing a it? long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. But you so know. anyway, keep hope alive. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We we That's will right. keep on having the conversation and trying to change the, you know, laws and all of that stuff, because. Can we talk about that? Cause you've mentioned that a few times. You well, know. you know, I actually mentioned to Dr. Cindy, I said, you know, I would like to be part of, you know, changing the laws and stuff. And I am so anti-politics, but I said, this is the one thing that I would get on. And if I have to go to Congress and 
Mm -hmm. I said, sign me up. So yeah, definitely. Tanika, Tanika Gray Valburn with the White Dress Project. Yeah, she's been on she's Black Doctor several the, times. Yeah, she's on the front lines. I met her like in at Essence Fest. So when I was doing a screening at Essence Fest of this film several years ago, she moderated um she moderated my session. And ever since then, um, we've been able to work together because she's also in Atlanta. But the work that she's doing, um, working with the senators and everybody in Congress to try to get laws passed is remarkable, really. And that she still has a day job and right. then she's doing this on the side just to 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 try to help people is amazing. And so that is, she does uh, amazing work with um, fibroids, but there are a lot of organizations that hold advocacy days for other causes like PCOS Challenge, which mm -hmm. is run by Sasha Adi, uh, a black woman. And, and she goes to Capitol Hill or virtually now uh, to deal with polycystic ovary syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Resolve has an advocacy, day, the National Infertility Association. That's Cheryl um, Poston. Uh, yep, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, they make it possible for many of us to connect with our healthcare pro with our legislator. So it's a national event. And when it's virtual, you can do it really from your home computer. Um, and you get to speak with the legislative aides and let them know what you care about, uh, because they have to do what we put them in office to do. And if they yeah. don't know that you, you care about a thing, you can't be surprised if they don't support it. Amen. So let's get active, ladies. Let's get this done. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yes. She's doing a lot with fibroids. Um, Tanika did the white dress project to get because they, they need to do research to figure out why. Why and get a stop to it. Also, I think a lot of things, a lot of women don't realize that they are heavy bleeders. Yeah, because they just think that that's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be debilitated for you know a week or you're not. So, I didn't know. I didn't <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah, most people. I don't didn't have know you weren't supposed to have pain with your cramps until within the research you on this. Comfort project. and pain are two different things, and that's what people don't realize. So, if you are in pain, like you miss a day of school because you're cramping, you miss a day of work because you're cramping. That that isn't the level of you shouldn't have that kind of pain. Like there's probably an underlying situation there. And I didn't know, cause I always have like a bad, uh, the first day would always just be really bad. But I just thought, well, my mama had a first day that was bad. All of my friends missed the first day. That's it's right. bad. You sit out of gym class cause you got cramps Um, if That's you're right. in high school. So it's normalized that it's a part of being you know, having a cycle, your womanhood. That's right. And then to find out, no, you shouldn't be in bed all day. That's that, right. that wasn't supposed to happen. That's right. Absolutely. I, I have memories of standing outside, waiting for somebody to pick me up um, at high school, first day of every period. Like I would be throwing up in the bushes. I thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. Like I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't realize that that was just not right, not normal um, until I was older. Well, I mean, I was diagnosed with endometriosis at 18. So then I found out, okay, some of this is not not right. But I just had these experiences like Chiquita was talking about yeah. where I, it was just normal for me, the pain, the really heavy bleeding, the vomiting. It just was what it was. But we don't have to. Do, now we know. Yes. Now we can do better. Yes. Yeah. Oh, somebody said, please speak on your teens being prescribed birth control because their periods are so bad. Well, that's usually what they do is give you birth control so that you can um, regulate your cycles. And also it usually does lighten, lighten the flow. So that is something that they often do use to treat. I had a friend in high, um, college that that's what that's what they were using to treat because she had such horrible periods. But let's talk about the cause. So treating a symptom is different than understanding the, the cause. cause. Yeah. So why is your daughter having such heavy periods? Does she have endometriosis? Does she have fibroids? Is there is there an underlying cause? And that's what you need to go back and talk to your doctor about. It's great to treat the symptoms. We want to know really what the root is so that we can address that so that this doesn't have to be you know just a life of being anemic because I bleed so heavy, uh, you know, when I have my period that, that I'm anemic. Here she is. 
Also, um, can you please, Camille, because you mentioned endometriosis, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know a lot of people are like, what? Okay, so endometriosis is a condition where the tissue that lines the uterus, so if you think of the uterus almost as like a, a vase, a vase, this is the inside of the uterus. And this tissue right here, my skin cells, are the, are the cells that, that shed, that you bleed out every month, okay? If you take these cells that are normally inside the uterus, I don't know, my, my hand is not probably the best example, but if you take the, the cells that are normally on the inside of the uterus that you bleed out every month, and you take those normal cells, but you put them in different places. So instead of on the inside of the uterus, you put them on the outside of the uterus, or you put it on the bowel, you know, or you put it just any place else in the body, they're going to act like normal endometrial cells. They're going to bleed and they're going to try and shed, right? But they can't go anywhere because the uterus, there, there's an exit right. out of the uterus. This is why you have periods. The blood is able to be shed. But if it's if it's in if it's at another place, it's not going to go anywhere. So you're going to end up getting cuz so the body anything that is in a place that it's not supposed to be, um the body looks at it as foreign and and it tries to wall it off. Um and so walling it off looks like scar tissue sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you could that's why people with endometriosis also often have a lot of scar tissue in their belly. Um, when they, if they get their bellies opened up, a lot of times they have a lot of old blood in there. Um, and that's just from this normal endometrium that's in the wrong place, bleeding month after month. Uh, they can develop what they call chocolate cysts, which are just like big blood clots of this endometrial tissue, which is just, you know, kind of formed a clot uh, in the wrong place where it can't leave the body. So it's, it's a condition that really can, um, cause extreme pain. And, and the sister of endometriosis is adenomyosis. And it's when that same tissue starts to grow in the lining of the uterus. So instead of growing outside, for instance, on the, on the colon or on the outside of the uterus, it, gro it grows right inside in the lining of it. And, so that same thing is happening, you know, it's bleeding every month and it's really eating away the, the, um, lining, the muscle lining. Um, and that can make it very difficult, um, to have children. And, and I personally had endometriosis and adenomyosis. Oh, wow. Yep. Yep. And that's the reason why I wasn't able to get pregnant. Kelly, I'm sorry. Can I say something to that? First of all, the devil is a liar. Tried to keep me out of here. Yeah. I just want to thank Regina Townsend, who was on his on the chat, making sure everybody knew I was trying to get back in. Sorry about that. But to what Dr. Camille was saying about endometriosis and um, adenomyosis, because a friend of mine um, suffers from that. But Dr. Camille, can you speak a little bit about painful intercourse? Because this is a myth that a lot of people with uterus have that the if they're having um intercourse with a male counterpart and sometimes they say well he was too big because it was hurting um it yeah. hurt a little bit you know sometimes intercourse is uncomfortable for me a lot of people with uteruses a lot of people a lot of women don't understand that that is a signal of an underlying condition of something else going on that intercourse is not supposed to be painful yeah. it is not supposed to hurt that way the same way with your menstrual cycles you're not supposed to have to stay home from school or stay home from work those are indications of underlying conditions because a lot of women are walking around thinking intercourse is uncomfortable with this guy or that guy but really they may be suffering from adenomyosis can you speak a little bit to that i, I think that you summed it up very nicely i mean if you are experiencing vaginal dryness that's one thing. And you can get support for that, you know, right at the pharmacy, you can get blue, but there's no such thing as he was too big. I mean, our vaginas were designed to expand. We push babies out of oh, that. Right, right. And there's no baby <laughs> that it, there's no, not to, you know, be direct, but there's no penis that's bigger than a baby. Come on. Uh, okay. So when, when you are, when you're feeling like, he's too big or, you know, sex was uncomfortable. Spe sex was actually made pleasurable. So we want to do it. So we procreate. Okay. 
So um, that's definitely something that you need to speak with your doctor about and to not be embarrassed to talk about. It's just medical and there's no judgment. There's nothing wrong with you. Get the information so that you can figure out what's happening and get it addressed. So thanks for bringing that up, Kelly. If you're uncomfortable talking to your doctor about it, you need to get another doctor. That's right. If you don't, if your doctor is not open and, you know, and you don't feel like you can share these things with them, then you need to find another doctor because this is important. This is part of your health. It is very important. Just like your temperature and your blood pressure, this is important too. So make sure that you do. If you can't talk to them, you do not have to stick with the same doctor. You can find someone else. Absolutely. Please go find a doctor. And if you are not a vocal person yourself, because sometimes you can have a great doctor, but you are embarrassed. You don't quite know the words to say. I always tell women, write down your questions before your doctor's appointment, because in the moment, especially if you're hearing some news or you might forget exactly what you wanted to say, and then you might put it off. And that time that you put it off could be crucial time for you. And also, if you feel like, I just don't like bringing these things up, my doctor is great, but I don't like bringing these things up, maybe bring along a friend or a family member or an advocate to help you or to even ask the questions on your behalf. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If there's somebody else that you trust, um, bring them along because this is your health that you're talking about. So write those questions down and bring your, your notebook so you can write the answers. And if you have follow-up questions, this is your appointment. Get it out. Um, and if, if talking is not your strong suit, that's fine. Just bring somebody who it is. Yeah. And with this, um, with the fertility journey, let me tell you, and all of you guys know there was so many directions and so much information. So if you are not someone who can sit there and take it all in, cause it's a whole lot, then you need to make sure you have somebody with you or make sure that they email you the direction, something, just make certain that you have all the information. And somebody said, put them on speakerphone. Yes, if you can't have them physically there, but you need another set of ears, put them on speakerphone. Cause I mean, if you go to the doctor and they give you a hard blow and I don't care if it's fertility or whatever, you might need somebody else there to take in the information. Cause like she said, especially with this, time is not on your side. So because you were so upset by what they said or you didn't even understand what they said and you don't come back for another three months, that three months, as um, as you know, we've already mentioned, you guys, that that three months, your AMH could drop down to the, you know, to nothing. So please make certain that you clearly understand. And if you don't, you have somebody who's on the speakerphone or sitting there with you that is taking in all of this information because it can be a lot. And then especially if you do begin to journey with all the medications, it's timely. You got to dose yourself. I mean, there is a whole lot involved. It is quite a commitment. It's a financial commitment, but it's a mental and physical commitment. You have to make sure that you got all the directions and all the information you understand implicitly. So you need to ask the 100 questions because you need to understand, you know, because there could be a difference between you taking your trigger shot at the wrong time or the right time because you didn't understand it was AM and not PM, you know little things like that. So it's very important that you do have a doctor that explains everything to you down to the T and that you feel okay asking the 1 million questions you might have. So we went over, but I want Kalei to please talk about her film that please, I hope that we can one day see. Hi, I hope y'all can one day see it too, man. Like with the COVID, and look, Shaquita can talk to this with eggs over easy, honey, selling the thing, girl. Like you know, development in in this in the entertainment industry is it's a beast. Um, it is one of those things that they put with COVID. It backed up my film, uh, which backs up my financing. So it will be done to God be the glory. Whether it is at Lifetime or whether it's at a net another network, it's a beautiful script and um, it will be done. So right now it is it is owned by Lifetime and A&E Studios Amen. and I really cannot wait to bring it to you. I will not stop doing what I do. Um, and I'm so glad to uh, continue to use my art to speak to this issue, to speak to black women and fertility because we so need everybody that has a platform and we all do, no matter how big or small, it is a platform, your voice matters. And we all need to know that we are not alone and that there are there are people there to support us. So I that's why I give such a big cheer to Shaquita and the years yes. that she put into Eggs Over Easy, Thanks. filming it, traveling, 
finding the different stories to tell, editing it down, submitting it to different networks until somebody said yes, and it was the right yes, um, so that it reaches the right audience. So understand what this woman has sacrificed in order to get these stories told. It takes years for these things to happen. I mean, I'm probably on year three and a half, so I'm probably, Shaquita can probably tell me, girl, you got about another three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep saying it out loud, Dr. Renee and everybody, because I believe, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God that what you Amen. speak, you will see. Amen. Um, the movie is sold. It is in development. It, it is going to be made come hella high water, honey. It's, it's probably going to be the first baby that I birthed. And, and I can't wait until you guys see it. Yes. And we'll have to have you back here, Black Doctor, to talk all about it because I am very excited to see it. Amen. Um, Camille, I know, I like I said, I put the link in, cadefoundation.org. I know you're having one of your discussions on January 14th. Is that right? Uh, you know what? I'm not quite sure. Okay, but I I'm think sure. that's it. I just looked at your website today. You but saw, I, then, then if it's yeah. there, then yes. Yes. But if you go to her website, you will see she has uh, discussions where they will be able to answer questions about the grants. Oh, yes. If you yes, have yes, any yes. questions about the grants, they do go um, live on Zoom and you can yes. get those questions answered. Um, all the criterion is there about the grant so you can understand how, what, and all that stuff. So please visit her website. And if you can donate, definitely donate because obviously please. this is a nonprofit and yes. this is how she can give the grants because people donate. Exactly. They have a yearly gala, which I'm exactly. sure will be in person in 2022, God willing, right? Yay! That's so, right. <laughs> look, That's I'm, right. I'm, look, I'm about to go find me something where I'm coming because I want to get your food. dress. So, yes. Yes. So, yeah. So everyone, please follow KateFoundation.org. Oh, Kalei, when is Warrior Wednesdays? Is every Wednesday? Well, it used to be every Wednesday and I got a little bit busy with um, the acting and the writing of it all. And, and, and this is also one of the things that I can say to this when you ask that question. So it does happen. And I always post on a Tuesday beforehand. And the last one we did was November 20th, which was National Adoption Day. We had Nkechi Carroll speaking. She is the showrunner, you guys, for All American on the CW. Oh, that yeah. a, a lot of people love that show and Homecoming. And she talked about her adoption story and, and the process of adopting out of the foster care system. So you can check that out mm -hmm. on my IGTV um, until my next Warrior Wednesdays comes up. But it's one of the things that I have learned in this process is self-care. And I set myself up to do something every single week. And it was a glorious every single week journey until it became taxing on my own spirit. Because sometimes we we need to sit back and say, it's okay not to do it this week. And, and maybe yeah. even the following week. So I am still here. I am still coming on on Wednesdays. Um, but if you don't see me, it's either because of work or it's self-care. It's one or the other. And I think that we really need to make sure we give ourselves self-care when we're on the fertility journey, especially. It's okay it's to, work. to, to stop work. and pause. We will still be there. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And someone asked, and once again, we will say eggs over easy. Airs on OWN on January. Tuesday, January 4th, 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern. And Pacific. 9 o'clock Pacific and Eastern. 9 o'clock Pacific and Eastern. Everyone got that? So that covers the whole state, whole country. So yes. you guys don't miss it. It's going to be amazing. We already said the hashtag is eggs over easy film. So when you get online and you're talking about it, make sure that you use that hashtag because we know that these things count and people look at these things because we want we want Shaquita to be able to make many, many more films. Yeah. And we want and we want to 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 set a precedent to say we are interested in more than just documentaries about black people and music. We like music, help. but we also need help. Yes. Amen. So let's show up for her. Yes. Because we need to show up because these stories are very important. Black Doctor, we I had a discussion with the owner and we are going to talk about fertility in 2022. So be on the lookout. I'm here every Thursday, six o'clock Eastern. And um, this is what this is where I am. Uh, next week, of course, is the new year. So we're going to have new year, new you, because we all need to start off the new year, right? So we will talk about that next week. But we are going to talk about the male side of, fertil of infertility. We're going to talk about gestational carriers. There was a fabulous company owned by a black woman that's in the film. And I'm going to reach out to her. And then 
Oh. I'm just nosy. I need to know what happened to that fabulous couple that went through the whole film. I need to know. <laughs> so I'm going to find her. <laughs> like, I got to know. I was like, we're going to wait till the film airs. And after that, I was like, I want to know. Because that She's was just. going to talk afterwards. So yeah, she was. They were beautiful. And I just loved them. I loved them. So, um, so yeah. So thank you, everyone, for watching tonight. Thank you, ladies, for giving your time because you did not have to. I so appreciate you all answering my emails and my DMs. And uh, good night, everyone. And happy new year to all of you ladies and everyone. Happy Kwanzaa. Today is Nia. Purpose. We all have a purpose, and that is to advocate for the fertility journey of Black women. Thank you for having us. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Happy New Year. January 4th. Set your DVRs. See you at Don't XLE, January 4th. <laughs>